Namaste and kia ora. I'm Christine Maiden Sharp, Chief Executive of the Aspen Institute New Zealand, and together with our partner Ananta Aspen, we're delighted to welcome you to the third of a series of dialogues between our two countries. Our purpose is to turbocharge the relationship by opening new channels for collaboration through the Institute's international network. In our forum today, Sustainable Food Futures, we'll explore how New Zealand's expertise in farming, agriculture and agritech can support India's Make in India campaign and help revolutionize its food supply chain. We aim to identify three takeaways that you, the audience, can run with. One, the scope and scale of India's food revolution. Two, where the opportunities are in R&D skills and technology. And three, examples of mutually beneficial business models. We're honored to welcome Her Excellency, Ms. Nita Bhushan, High Commissioner of India to New Zealand, to make the opening remarks, and our panelists. And from India, we welcome Pramit Pal Shaduri, India Practice Head for Eurasia Group and Fellow at the Ananta Aspen Center, with a global view on the macro issues, including climate change, agricultural diversification, and structural changes. Dr. Bagheera Chowdhury, Founder and Director of South Asia Biotech, with a long-term focus on agriculture, the mother of the country, including developing bio-innovations from lab to the land. And from New Zealand, we welcome Amit Gupta, Group CEO and Founder Ecosystem Group, Chair of TIE Global, who's on a mission to feed the world by leveraging agritech and blended finance. Jeff Allott, Executive Director and Founder of Quality New Zealand, operating in India for over 11 years across 43 cities, specializing in supply chain solutions and adding value through agritech education. Moderating the discussion, we're in the able hands of Kartiki Randawa from Ananta Aspen. Kartiki will lead the conversation for the next 40 minutes when we'll open the floor to questions. And we encourage you to send your questions through the chat line. Over to you, Kartiki. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, Christine, and I welcome everyone to the roundtable on sustainable food futures. It's a pleasure to have all of you here and as we embark on this crucial journey and look forward to, a, to an insightful discussion today. So as you're aware, uh, today's conversation will talk about how New Zealand's knowledge in farming and agri-tech can help India's Make in India campaign and transform its food supply chain. The goal here is to create a lasting partnership between both countries by using the advanced technologies and the sustainable methods to produce and distribute high quality food efficiently and securely. As Christine mentioned, we are privileged to be joined by the High Commissioner of India to New Zealand, Ms. Nita Bhushan, to open the session and set the stage for the discussion. Following the High Commissioner's remarks, we will uh, hear from our four distinguished speakers. So without any further ado, uh, High Commissioner, may I request you to give your opening remarks? Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste and Kiora, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here. Let me start by thanking the Ananta Aspen Center, Christine, and uh, you, Kretuki, for uh, you know organizing this. And uh, I would like to start in, by saying that uh, this uh, discussion is very timely. Uh, this is a time when both India and New Zealand have been working a lot with each other on various issues. And we see this, uh, you know, transformation in our partnership to, uh, you know, coming to this level. Uh, we have a lot of high level visits uh, happening. And as you probably have seen in the media that uh, the President of India, Honorable uh, Her Excellency Srimati Draupadi Murmu will be visiting New Zealand shortly. Uh, before that, we've seen a series of visits uh, to India from uh, Honorable Todd McClay and uh, earlier the uh, Foreign Minister, Minister, Right Honorable Winston Peters, you know, just to name a few. And a number of visits are in the pipeline. So it, I would, uh, you know, it is very clear to everyone that discussions are taking place at the highest level uh, to find out ways uh, how both countries can work together for a sustainable future. I think both countries uh, realize that uh, in this present scenario, when there are several you know, conflicts in various parts of the world, we've seen disruptions uh, during COVID time. And uh, essentially, you know, it is absolutely essential for us to work together, learn from each other, 
and participate in each other's uh, initiatives and uh, uh, campaigns. On this note, I would like to say that uh, uh, traditionally, uh, New Zealand has been exporting uh, some, uh, you know, number of primary products to India, and uh, any discussion on, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we have to work together on food security uh, refers uh, somewhat to the ongoing trade as well. But uh, what we have seen is now that the discussions have started shifting to sectoral col collaborations and cooperations and value-added products. Uh, so in this regard, it is uh, absolutely, I would say, right to say that New Zealand has the skills and India has the scale uh, with a population of 1.4 billion people. We are the most populous country in the world. And at the same time, uh, a growing middle class uh, ensures that there is a huge market as well for New Zealand products. In uh, terms of uh, how we can work together, you know, I would just like to mention that we are already working together a lot in several sectors, such as uh, uh, livestock and disease management, use of technology in farms, uh, sharing of best practices to feed uh, milk and for testing and, uh, you know, other veterinary issues. Some New Zealand companies like Abacus Bio, are already in India working on goat genetics and breeding programs. Winseed is in India selling uh, carrot, beetroot, and other vegetable seeds in India. Uh, what is really uh, interesting is that several New Zealand companies are setting up bases and participating in the Make in India initiative, adding value, you know, uh, learning from the local conditions, employing uh, people, and then, uh, you know, selling to uh, various outlets in India itself. So I think these provide a perfectly, you know, win-win situations. Um, I have, uh, in my tenure, you have seen a large number of uh, delegations uh, coming from India in the dairy and uh, food sector. And similarly, you know, New Zealand uh, business delegations going to India. And uh, 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 what has also excited me is that uh, there is a uh, uh, connect between our research institutions and they are looking at what uh, is being developed in India, what is being done and how uh, India can take or learn more from uh, New Zealand in uh, these areas. You know, Binston Farms, we know that uh, Earl Rattray, who was the former chair of Air India New Zealand Business Council, he set up a farm. He's, uh, uh, which supplies, uh, you know, food and milk to uh, areas uh, near uh, Delhi and Gurugram. And uh, uh, in fact, several state governments have visited and they are and have entered into memorandums of understanding on such products. Uh, so I think the uh, realization is very much there that we need to, uh, you know, like-minded countries like India need to work together and that uh, we have to explore greater opportunities. And I'm uh, very, uh, you know, happy to note that both Indian companies are investing so much in New Zealand and in New Zealand companies taking part in India, and especially in the Make in India initiative. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for those insightful remarks. So uh, without delaying anything, let's jump right in. So Jeff, I'll come to you first. Uh, since you've mentioned that you have 11 years of experience with the agricultural products, can you shed some light on how New Zealand uh, adapted to this evolving agribusiness landscape and uh, what does this evolution uh, portend uh, for the India-New Zealand trade relationship? Thanks, uh, Kartiki, and namaskar, um, kia ora, everybody. Um, Christine, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to be on the panel, um, but more importantly, actually, for exposure to the Indian opportunities as a whole. Um, what we've found over the last 11 years is that um, storytelling has been hard uh, and getting creating awareness of what is actually going on already between our countries uh, and telling that story um, has been relatively difficult and it's tremendous to see now the momentum, you know, that our governments uh, are creating. Um, I just want to make a, a special mention before I answer the question. 
um, to acknowledge Her Excellency Anita Bushan as well. Um, not only is she a significant uh, supporter and advocate of, of closer relationships between our countries, but on a personal company level, she has um, gone well beyond what would you, you'd expect from, from someone so busy. Um, but so we're very grateful for that. Um, to answer the, the question, yeah, the 11 years uh, hasn't always been smooth sailing. We've seen, though, unbelievable change um, happening and the momentum is picking up all the time. For those people that are and have been to India um, uh, in the last year or two, um, you will have noticed a change even from, uh, from uh, you know, five years or so ago. Um, for us, it was about doing due diligence in the market to understand how we could be successful in India. And, and largely that meant that we had to understand local needs. And I think that applies to what we're talking about, what the topic of conversation is today. Um, it's all very well having the technology and it's all very well having the systems. But if we don't actually ask the question of what is required, um, how can we have the biggest impact um, and really get in and understand um, within India what those, um, those uh, assets might be that we can supply and, and collaborate with? Then you know we're we're not doing justice to um, to the Indian uh, opportunity, and so for us you know we we ended up setting up a business in India. Uh, we now um, to Her Excellency's point, we now have a factory in India where we're adding value uh, to our imported product from the Alliance Group um, and our five thousand um, farmers. So uh, from that, it's a matter of being able to localize product. Uh, it's been able to um, build direct relationships and customers uh, with customers, I should say. Um, and it's about having that day-to-day -day, uh, eyes and ears uh, from our senior leadership team, you know, who are feeding back and helping with our, our decision-making. Uh, so um, so we think uh, that's that understanding the local needs is a massive point. And of course, the other part is um, building partnerships and relationships. And it's, and it's basic, and we understand that, but you know, coming into market once or twice a year just doesn't cut it. Uh, you have to be in the market um, as often as you can and preferably, I believe, with relationships within India. Uh, that is the catalyst to then um, building that rapport, building respect, um, and actually, ironically, building trust. Um, and that's the big thing that will then enable stronger, deeper relationships Um and, and, you know, I had dinner actually last night with a, a up in Lucknow and, um, and it was a really interesting point that was made. The first question um, I was told that was when I was going in to see some, some senior ministers was, you know, they will want to know exactly why you're here and how you are going to actually add value. And it's an absolutely fair point. Um, you know, we need to be coming to India with some solutions, some reasons as to how we can add value uh, to India. Um, before we start putting our hand out and taking. So um, so that's probably a, a couple of insights um, into our journey. Uh, our journey includes um, also an education vertical now uh, where tra talent transformation is very important. And of course that comes across in both um, agri-tech uh, and ed-tech. Uh, and we see enormous opportunities with the government, uh, obviously the Indian government putting a huge focus on education. Uh, and we're incredibly excited. I think we now have over 107 institutions that are signed up um, who are extremely interested uh, in some forms of collaboration. And we're really proud of those connections. Um, so that's another opportunity. And I think in being in market once again, uh, it, it allows you, as I mentioned before, to, to, to build that rapport and relationships uh, directly. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, I'll come back to you. But for now, let's go to Bhagirath. Uh, so um, as, as you mentioned, uh, your organization brings agri-tech and uh, uh, agri-tech to the farmers. So since you're involved in both the R&D and its implementation, can you tell us what are the current challenges that the farmers are facing locally? And uh, if there is any technology, what kind of technology solutions are being deployed? Thank you, Kartiki. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, thank um, uh, Christine um, uh, from the Spain, uh, also the Ananta Center. I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Her Excellency, Madam Busan, my fellow panelists, and all those who joined from India and uh, New Zealand. Thank you so much for this opportunity. 
I before I go to your question, I would like to really highlight um, uh, something that relates to agriculture and today's topic. You know, agriculture and allied sectors um, can be livestock, fisheries, or forestries. It is a backbone of 1.4 billion Indians actually, and 60% of them actually makes their income and livelihood from agriculture. So the magnitude and enormity of the sector can be understood understood by the involvement of the Indians in agriculture and food sectors. India currently, agriculture contributes almost um, 17 to 18% of the GDP, which if you really really look at in terms of the um, uh, dollars, it's close to 402 billion US dollar. Um, and that 17, 18% is close to 3 billion, trillion dollar economy that we have for the country. Government of India estimates that Indian agriculture will become $1 trillion um, economy. That's a $1,000 billion economy by 2030. And having said the potential uh, for the agriculture, government has been taking enormous steps in last uh, two and a half decades that I closely follow. And I would like to really highlight those very important steps um, that why countries like India and New Zealand should collaborate more, strengthen their collaborative opportunities, bring people and those who are into farming and systems and technologies and entrepreneurs together to see uh, that those $1 trillion opportunity by 2030 can be harnessed jointly by these two countries. So I would like to actually highlight four very important um, areas of development that's happening in the country, uh, which might be very useful for people who are who have joined today. So number one is that the government has taken decisive actions on long-term pending policy and regulatory matters whether it's related to market access or free trade agreements. We have seen sea change happening in both market uh, access and also on the free trade um, agreements that um, India is embarking on journey with related to agriculture and food. This is very important simply because India's agriculture remain um, protected for uh, since independence. So that change is very, very important for the companies and institutions to recognize. Secondly, India is creating this very enormous digital public infrastructure. We have seen digitization of transactions, supply chain happening rapidly at both rural and urban level. Urban level that used to happen, but rural economy is becoming part and parcel because of this public digital infrastructure in agriculture and rural sector. So that's a very second important uh, regulatory developments or policy development that we see in the country. Thirdly, we are also building up tremendous social respect for people engaged in economy. You know, so farming community, um, uh, we have close to um, uh, 140 crore, that's a 14 million uh, farmers who are engaged into agriculture. And I think uh, that is motivating and mobilizing them to go beyond their very um, uh, systems of working in a narrow uh, setting in the country. So that, that respect is also bringing the whole rural India to the mainline economy of the country. And last but not the least, Government of India has been putting up close to $15 billion worth of investment in agriculture welfare schemes, um, where they are not only transferring money to the farming community, but also building up uh, projects and programs that are very important to increase the competitiveness of Indian agriculture. So that's, and uh, finally, you know, close to $1.5 billion worth of R&D investment in agriculture infrastructure. So these five, six very important development that I've seen, I think, it enables and allows us to see how best we can harness uh, the opportunity be between these two countries. I would like to come to the, your question directly now, and I'll not take much time. You know, in India, we have a national agriculture research system. Um, it comprises of Indian agriculture research institutions, state agriculture industries, um, and large number of private sectors that is very much engaged at, as Honorable um, Her Excellency mentioned. Um, we have very robust seed sector, biotechnology sector, livestock, fisheries, uh, forestries, a uh, tremendous number of institutions. My institution has a long-term collaboration with Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and we are trying to see how best we can help farming community to produce better quality high-value crops. For example, spices. We work very closely with large number of farmers who uh, are engaged in spices sector. New Zealand is one of all very important market for Indian spices, both seed spices as well as other spices. And we are also trying to see that how best we can take technologies that can help to address the mounting challenges of 
climate change where they see changing in pest dynamics, um, the quality is being deteriorated. Um, so how do you enable farming communities so that they can produce better quality goods that can uh, then be part and parcel of the uh, major exports of agri commodity that are happening from India? To the group, finally, I would like to say that in uh, last few years, India's export has also um, happening at a very high level. We have achieve, achieved $50 billion worth of agri commodity export and uh, we are doing close to $4.5 billion worth of uh, spices um, uh, trade from the country. I believe there are tremendous opportunities exist in the whole um, agriculture landscape, uh, agro uh, ecosystem that is being built up as part of the Make, or, Make in India program for the country to see how best India and New Zealand, New Zealand can collaborate uh, to further increase uh, both countries' participation in uh, $2 trillion um, uh, international trade in agriculture commodity that we have. So I would be very happy to suggest some of the measures that I believe are very important to further strengthen these collaborative opportunities uh, as our president uh, visits uh, uh, New Zealand in the future so that farmers, researchers, uh, and the entrepreneurs can come together and build this large, longest bridge between India and New Zealand. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Bhagirath. Uh, so I'll, again, I'll come back to you. But uh, Amit, uh, I wanted to ask you that, uh, I mean, can you take this conversation forward in a more bilateral space? And uh, I mean, comment on, you know, why New Zealand is the best partner for uh, India, for agri-tech and, ag and for agri-finance? And, uh, and how can we build a tech ecosystem to support our mutual goals? Well, um, uh, thank you, Kartiki. First of all, um, namaste, kia ora, um, Your Excellency High Commissioner, uh, Nita Bhushan, thank you so much for taking the time. Christine and team uh, from Aspen and Ananta, uh, my fellow panelists and um, the attendees, thank you for this very meaningful discussion. So maybe I'll I'll sort of frame some context around this, Kartiki. I, I think I will be wary of saying that this is the best partnership possible. There is a, I will probably look at it uh, from a biased lens. So I'm in Indian New Zealand uh, living in Singapore. Mm. Uh, and sometimes when you sit outside, you get a much better external perspective on the opportunities and challenges. And when I look at both India and New Zealand, they have such tremendous strengths um, that in my view, there was collaboration that could allow, enable these nations to work together, not just to solve for India and New Zealand and bilateral trade. Because I think, you know, the world we're living in today needs to go a lot beyond trade. There has to be some serious purpose behind this. And I genuinely believe that if you pull these two strengths together of these nations, uh, there is an opportunity to take that beyond India and New Zealand to solve for global hunger. And, and maybe I'll frame some context if that's, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, you know, High Commissioner referenced food security, and I think it's a, it's a major issue, not just for emerging countries or developing countries, I think it's a major issue for um, the developed economies as well, uh, because we can't be taking that for granted. And if you look at, let me start first with trade between India and New Zealand. I think it's really promising to see that more steps are being taken from New Zealand's standpoint to put emphasis on India. And I think, let's be very real. India is a $1.4 billion dollar uh, country. It is the fastest growing economy in the world. Everyone wants to be in India. I think, to be fair, I think New Zealand's been a little bit late. I think this is on New Zealand to try and tap into that market and equally for India to leverage the potential strengths that New Zealand can bring. So I think it's still not, it's still not too late. And I think with the efforts that are taking place now, especially over the last 12 months uh, for this bilateral trade, I think uh, presents a tremendous amount of opportunity. Now, when we look at agri-tech, the first thing you've got to consider is, let's look at New Zealand. New Zealand has a disproportionate agrarian economy. I mean, it's a nation of 5 million people um, that at least in some of the sectors is the largest, if not the largest, in the top three exporters in the world, right, within the agriculture field. And how do you achieve that? How has New Zealand achieved that? It's And it hasn't happened because New Zealand built some technology, some very innovative technology over the last few decades, and it, it's the way of life, right? You have to look back historically 
Um, and sometimes, you know, innovation stems from your own limitations and trying to overcome those limitations. And New Zealand's innovation around the agriculture economy started over 100 years ago when New Zealand invented refrigerated shipping, right? So for context, you have to look at the mindset of the economy. So innovation is a mindset. It's not something you build overnight. Um, if you look at what's uh, where does this technology come in and what does it solve? Uh, with 5 million people, you have to have technology that augments that human resource to have that level of yield, right? So it, everything from using the technology, uh, you know, whether it's modern technology like IoT and, and um, you know, drone technology, weather patterns, understanding how to get greater yield, as well as best practice in agriculture, um, driving greater yield. There's also a big focus on uh, optimizing supply chains. How do you make sure you build the strongest supply chains, not just from a technology perspective, but from a real physical supply chain standpoint? How do you build those supply chains across the different markets? Um, and the third, of course, is the ability to process at source. Um, and when I say process at source, and I will talk about how does New Zealand actually contribute to India in terms of processing, and I think I'll share some context from what I know about what Jeff's company is doing uh, and how that could benefit both countries. But I think the opportunity for New Zealand is to take that innovation, best practices, and find a foothold to collaborate with India. The opportunity in India is India has world-class public digital infrastructure. Everyone wants, in emerging countries, everyone is looking at India's public digital infrastructure. India is now playing a role to help support emerging nations build that. Right. So the opportunity for New Zealand today and India is to leverage each other uh, specifically around their, their strengths. So New Zealand's strength is being a technology enabled, technology and innovation enabled agrarian economy. And the strength for India is that it has immense digital capacity as the world's digital hub. And as you can see from the rollout of the digital public infrastructure, uh, has the ability to roll out at scale. So how do you take that R&D capability that New Zealand brings, and India is doing a lot of R&D as well, as, um, you know, as Bhagirat also mentioned, um, how, do you, you know, how do you combine those capabilities together, create one collaborative ecosystem, taking the best of both the, both the economies, place it in India, help solve for um, you know, uplifting the agrarian economy in India, uh, because India itself has uh, a lot of strengths spe specifically around supply chain. You're seeing a lot of Indian tech companies that are building very, very strong supply chain capabilities. Some of the most promising high growth digital supply chain companies uh, globally are actually emerging from India, like companies like Farai and, and Moglex. And there's many, many examples. So if you bring those capabilities, you have, you have the opportunity to first start in India, create increase the yield and production for farmers, allow to minimize spoilage so that you can actually get as much optimized produce from farm to fork. And third, enable the farmers to um, process at source so that they can move up the value chain. Because eventually everything that we do uh, in digital has to have an impact around capacity building. And we have to impact the lives of these farmers, right? And that contribute, you know, these farmers contribute the biggest part of India's, um, you know, economic contribution from a population standpoint. So how can we enable that? An example would be what Zespri is, has been striving to do is to help build processing capabilities uh, with their fruit production and enabling that. I believe it's in Himachal. I'm not sure. I can't recall now. But I would say New Zealand has if New Zealand wants better success, and this is where I might be a little bit controversial, I, I think we have to decouple it from the actual food product. Decouple the tech, best practice, technology, whether it's supply chain for yield or for processing from the actual product, right? It's great that Zespri is doing it, but then it's not going to create impact at scale. I think the opportunity is bring the technology capabilities. New Zealand has a very, very vibrant agri-tech uh, ecosystem. We should look at that. The New Zealand government should look at that and see how can they bring the best of that, bring that to India, 
Couple that with the best of the digital capabilities and the companies we have in India, because there's some amazing work happening there. There's a lot of work happening within the IITs and the IIMs, for example. Um, can, they, can that collaboration stem into one commercial um, arm that can actually then roll it out in India and then take it to the world? So a little bit of an idealistic view, but I do think it's it's very much possible because there is a need in India and because there is hunger in New Zealand today to tap into that market. And this to me is the best way for New Zealand to benefit and tap into the uh, Indian economy. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Amit. Uh, we'll, I'll get back to that point for sure. Um, so I'll turn to Pramit now uh, and uh, take this uh, and take it to an international cooperation angle. Uh, so Pramit, can you talk about India's current agricultural collaboration with Israel and the US? And uh, are there any lessons that you know we can learn from there? And also, how can you see New Zealand become a valuable partner in India, for a partner for India in this space? I mean, how do you view? New Zealand to become a partner. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of points, I think the first thing is just quickly sketch out where I see some of the <clears throat> coming challenges for, for agriculture and for the Indian government's own priorities. Um, <clears throat> one, you know, the original green revolution strategy of India, which was to generate huge amounts of grain, wheat and rice, basically, to solve what was endemic famine problems. Uh, India had famines all the way till the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> and so that became the primary focus of Indian agriculture. Obviously, we've now moved away from that. We have, if anything, excess amounts of grain. Um, and the problem with the green revolutionary, uh, green revolution structures are they're basically no longer sustainable in terms of the water, especially. Um, but even things on other, the consumption of fertilizer and so on. So we're now seeing the government agricultural policy slowly shifting, shifting slowly because there are obviously political issues with interest groups develop built around certain types of agricultural processes. Um, one is the issue of inflation, food inflation. Originally, it was protein inflation, I think was the big issue, uh, still is a problem as people get richer, they consume more and more protein. That's clearly happening in India. Uh, even with a population that's a roughly 40% vegetarian, legumes, uh, soya are, are issues as far as their, uh, that type of production. Poultry, uh, by far the fastest growing protein source in the country right now. Um, and dairy. Uh, dairy, of course, is the other big thing. In fact, the explosion in dairy consumption in India uh, has been one of the big shifts that we've seen as Indians have become wealthier. Um, across the country, and especially for vegetarians, this is a key source of protein uh, for them. And then the other issue now is a new issue that's come on top of this, if you wish, is climate. Uh, we've clearly seen uh, heat waves over the past three, four years, uh, past two years in particular, temperatures reaching, especially northern India, uh, reaching about <clears throat> um, 48 degrees, 50 degrees. This last climate wave that we've heat wave that we have is also extremely interesting from a purely scientific but alarming in one sense. Uh, while some crops, notably wheat, are very heat sensitive, quite if most of the others, rice and so on, are actually quite resistant. But it requires a simple requirement in, in if you wish, for most crops and vegetables is that there has to be a period in the nighttime when temperatures fall again. If they get about four or five hours of cool temperature, most plants can handle a heat wave in the daytime. We are not seeing that taking place anymore. That four or five hour cooling period at night is increasingly shrinking. It's now less than four hours, and we've been starting to experience that in Northwest India this year in particular. And we saw 20% of India's vegetable crop in these areas literally get wiped out. Um, <clears throat> This is now a crucial area because this is a tipping point as far as agricultural production is concerned. If that that lack of a light <clears throat> of that nighttime cooling period continues and spreads, India's agricultural production will collapse. And this is true not just for India, but so we need to develop. We need to be developing technologies. Um, we are developing technologies, but obviously this now has to be done on a more rapid on a more rapid phase. Um, so you have a whole set of technologies that now are required. I think right now in the monsoon uh, harvest that is being sown, about 25% of the 
harvest is climate resistant seed technologies that have been developed that are to some degree experimental but we need to accelerate this uh, this on a much on a much uh, faster level uh, genomic uh, technologies for example though uh, regrettably i think the indian court system has asked for a very complicated uh, uh, genetic modification uh, regulatory structure, which I think will slow that down. But there are other technologies in the hybrid area and so on that need to be uh, need to be carried out. So you see on the protein inflation side, that's one story. You see on the climate side, the others have already mentioned agricultural value, uh, working up the agricultural value chain. Um, on the dairy, that this is related to climate, but somewhat ancillary, is, is the issue of methane production. Uh, if India India producing actually surplus uh, uh, milk powder production, uh, we have massive surpluses which have to begun probably begin exporting at some point. We already started that game. Um, a lot of that will have to be green uh, eventually as it enters certain markets and global trading structures become more green oriented. That dairy production needs to green, and we know New Zealand is one of the world leaders. In, in controlling methane production on that front. So, and then finally on the structural side, uh, which feeds into the several issues I've already mentioned, agricultural value chains, for example. Um, one simple problem we're facing, the banking system of India doesn't know how to evaluate agricultural value chains. They have no clue because they've never had to worry about this. They were basically only concerned about bulk commodities and subsidy structures. When you talk to bankers about this, they said, we don't actually know how to evaluate an agricultural value chain. We don't know how to finance it because if we can't evaluate it, there's no way for us to tell. We need help. We need other banks to come and tell us, how do you do an agricultural value chain? Uh, because otherwise we don't know how to finance this within India, forget about uh, anywhere else. And this is something in New Zealand's already done, is far ahead of. The government, as some of you will know, is launching a huge program. They passed the acts of reviving India's once very vibrant cooperative, farming cooperative structure. We've had some obviously big successes, Amul Dairy, obviously. But there are thousands, tens of thousands of cooperatives in India, many of which have fallen into disarray uh, and are, are ceased to function. Those are going, there's going to be a huge drive to cooperate, uh, to do, to revive this. So all of these are elements of a new agricultural policy, uh, which other people have also mentioned, including a huge push for an agricultural technology, partly because of climate, partly because of changing food, food habits. Now, other countries, uh, Israel, for example, has been very big uh, in this area, it is set up by forgotten 14 centers of agricultural excellence across the country, specializing in different crops, different areas. What's What Israel is famous for and has sold itself to the country um, is it's the water superpower of the world, that in terms of water, wastewater, recycling, even a technology like detecting leaking water pipes, they are the world leaders on a, on a quantum level better than almost anybody else. Um, and this is known within the government. I once met an Israeli ambassador who'd come out meeting Prime Minister Modi, and I asked him, was a discussion about terrorism or defense? He says, no, it was 50% water. All your prime minister talked about was water, water. I need Israel to help me on water. <clears throat> and so, you know, you have, therefore, a brand, and Israel has, has built on this. Uh, the other country I should mention uh, is Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands is very similar to New Zealand, I think, in terms of its agroclimatic condition. Everybody knows it's an enormous food exporter. Uh, given its size, it's phenomenal. I think on 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 on, uh, on a parity with New Zealand, and they've also, a little bit more quietly, been focusing on vegetable production, increasing productivity, and. What is interesting now, you're starting to see this showing up in the shops in India and in supermarkets in India. I live in a suburb of Delhi, Noida. When I go to my local supermarket, I will actually get bags of vegetables saying Netherlands technology, Dutch technology on them. Uh, <clears throat> on, on Diwali, on a holiday, the holiday season, the, uh, the Israeli embassy will send, uh, will send boxes of Israeli grown vegetables to your home as a, as a, as a gift. 
The only New Zealand element is Zespri. You see them very clearly marketing their, their New Zealand uh, kiwi fruit in, in that shop, but it's mainly Zespri. The New Zealand part's a little on the small side uh, in the small farm. But I'm saying these are some of the elements we're starting to see, and I can see New Zealand coming into this at some point. A lot of this is there, um, and I think hopefully uh, we'll start to see some of that come to play. Thank you. Um, thank you, Pramit. Uh, so I think we have uh, some more time for another round of questions, but uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jeff and Amit a common question. So both of you can answer. Uh, why is it essential for New Zealand to develop a long-term strategic plan? I mean, from 10 to 50 years uh, for trade with India. And how can New Zealand show its commitment to uh, adding value to the Indian communities and uh, and the economic performance. I think I'll Thanks. refer to Jeff, who's been committing over the last 10 years. So <laughs> use that. Thank you, Ahmed. Appreciate that. Um, look, it, it's, it's actually a question that I'm incredibly um, passionate about uh, because fundamentally in New Zealand, I think many of our um, directors who are ultimately in control of company strategic plans uh, very much operate on a short-term um, time frame. So, you know, we're measuring our we're measuring our CEOs uh, with 12-month KPIs. Uh, but all of us know that India is not a 12-month country. Um, relationships within India don't take 12 months. Um, so, what I would love to see is uh, long-term strategic planning uh, by um, by businesses, um, by particularly governors um, of our large agricultural and education and tourism-based companies, uh, because uh, that will enable then a different lens to come across a different investment lens, a different time commitment lens that then gives you a, a, a probably a better opportunity of success. Um, that's quite different to how we're currently operating. I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, and I understand certainly that I know that um, Indian New Zealand Business Council has put together a, a strategic plan um, to present to government, and uh, and I understand that government were receptive to that, uh, which is great. I don't think New Zealand, quite frankly, has had a strategic plan for India, uh, and so you know what I really uh, want to see is is us all embracing and in, in all our respective industries um, a coordinated plan, uh, which cuts across uh, MPI, MB, NZTE, uh, all of our government services, as well as business, uh, exporters and agricultural uh, producers, um, both uh, product and service. Then we start to have a chance. And I think some really interesting, fascinating points that have been raised here. Um, some of those points we need to prioritise. Um, climate change is, is having a massive effect on all of us. Education is is something that the Indian government are incredibly passionate about and want and must have must have change on. Um, and New Zealand can play a massive role in that. So, as soon as I think we articulate a really clear strategic plan, it'll also then um, dilute any uh, hesitation from both sides that we're coming in with a different mandate or we're coming in for a different purpose, other than to to mutually. Um, or to have mutual benefit uh, for for both countries, and so you know that's I'm I'm a massive advocate, long term planning, long term um, uh, strategic awareness, uh, and a commitment. Particularly, I'll put it back on our New Zealand directors uh, of our large uh, institutions to to educate themselves, come into market, see the opportunities, speak to the experts. Then this country will go forward. Yeah, and if, if I may just add, and you know, I'm not trying to promote Jeff's company, but I think Jeff's company is a great example of what that long-term commitment means, right? So Quality New Zealand has been in India, I believe, since 2013, if not longer. Um, and now, with your ability that you know you've created this new capability to process in India, which means you're creating employment in India, you're you know you're basically creating the value addition in India which means you're competitive with your products and you're able to um, ensure that we, you, you know, you can, um, you know, you can tap it in the market and that probably explains why you have um, a majority stake of the market that you play in, right? So, and puts New Zealand as the market leader in that segment. So I think, I think there is that proven model. 
I, I will say that, you know, from a, you know, sometimes, you know, just to add to what Jeff said, the long-term view, we have to look back historically a little bit, right? So India, I think New Zealand, India does not need New Zealand. Let's be very clear. India has many options today, right? And I'm not trying to trivialize it. India does have many options. It's a very competitive environment that everyone wants to be in India. New Zealand has $1 billion plus, 1 billion people plus market left to tap. And New Zealand has to tap that, right? And it's a little bit late in the game. And I think there's a reason for that. I think as Jeff mentioned, educating the companies, I think the perception, you have to understand the socioeconomic build of nations, especially immigrant nations. And you have to look, look at other nations like the US and the UK compared to New Zealand. New Zealand is still first generation immigrant population coming in. So the perception of India within New Zealand, while New Zealand is a very respectful country and very open-minded, very respectful, their exposure to India is what they see of the immigrant population in India today, which is now moving up the value chain, but it takes time. In the US and UK, that immigrant population is now third generation. That wealth has been created. Indians are the richest ethnic group in the US per capita and has the highest contribution of CEOs of some of the largest companies in the world, including some of the largest tech companies. And we all know that, right? New Zealand has not seen that. So New Zealand is looking at that from a very external lens. So their perception of India has been based on what they see in the media, or what they might see in movies, you know, where everything, you know, gets, gets a little bit trivialized. So, but I think now there is clarity that there is a lot of opportunity in India. And I think that focus has started, but I think they will have to look at it from a long-term lens because as I said, India has many options. I mean, Pramit just shared two examples of Israel and, and Netherlands. And I was gonna say, I mean, Netherlands is actually, New Zealand is second after Netherlands in terms of the aggregated economy per, G, per, uh, per capita. And so if they're already in there, it's already a little bit late for New Zealand. And, but I think the opportunity has to be looked at very, very clearly. It cannot be based on what New Zealand wants to do. It has to be based on what India needs. So I think that lens has to be reversed. And Pramit, you gave a great example of alternative foods like food tech. New Zealand has a very vibrant food tech ecosystem and New Zealand needs that food tech ecosystem because livestock based uh, produce um, creates its own risks and challenges. And looking at the huge vegetarian population in India, what a great opportunity if you could collaborate between those two ecosystems around food tech. So plant, if, let's just start with protein-based food um, to tap into that market. But then eventually you take that, you have to take a long-term view, build for India, but then also to help India export using New Zealand's uh, existing supply chains and customer customer and consumer supply chains to the rest of the world. So I think it has to be a two-way process. It will, if it's, I think it's, if it's about transacting and getting lots of business from India today, I think it's the wrong place for New Zealand to target. I think if it's about joint wealth creation and solving for a bigger problem um, that goes beyond India and New Zealand, I think the opportunity is there. And I think India will be very open to it because if you see India's playing a very large role in trying to solve for that globally. And I think this that approach from New Zealand will appeal to India. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Amit and Jeff, for uh, for that answer. Uh, also, before I go to the panelists uh, for the uh, for the next question, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, there's a Q and A window right next to the uh, chat button where they can uh, uh, add their questions. So uh, moving on. Um, so there's a combined question for uh, Pramit and Bhagirath. Uh, both of you have already made your references uh, to this, but I like to add a little bit more and get more uh, out of uh, the two of you. Uh, so what role does biodiversity play in India's agricultural strategy? Uh, Pramit talked about heat waves and the challenges of uh, climate change to the Indian agricultural system, do challenges of biosecurity and quarantine measures play into this? And uh, what are the biggest problems? And to that, I mean, add the bilateral element again, are there any particular R&D partnerships that India and New Zealand should embark on to find solutions to these challenges? That's right. So, um... Thank you, Kartiki. Um, I think I get 
incredible um, uh, converge convergence of ideas that I just heard Amit Jeff on uh, Pramiji. Um, and I would like to uh, build up the argument for next two, three minutes about what possibly um, is doable uh, in the near future, near to mid future between um, India and New Zealand. Um, I believe, um, and based on the understanding that I have from the ground, working closely with smallholder, large number of farming community in the country, I think they are facing three, a trica of challenges, uh, which I think we need to um, see how best we can uh, bilaterally work together to overcome those challenges. So first one, eminent from what Parmitji has said, uh, how do we safeguard the production of green revolution technologies? Um, safeguarding uh, food grain production is, I think, uh, most critical uh, before uh, we embark on the journey to look at uh, other aspects of uh, nutrition or any other, uh, any other aspects of uh, feeding uh, 1.4 billion people. So the second very important uh, areas of um, Parmeji touched about uh, the pro protein deficiency, or there is a quest uh, for the consumer to go for um, high protein products uh, for uh, predominantly a vegetable vegetarian economy. So I think uh, working on nutritional security component as India is facing tremendous challenges with malnutrition issues at lower strata in the society, I think we need to look at biofortification, um, not only uh, at the grain uh, uh, breeding stages, but also look at viable uh, tools and technologies to deliver those uh, micronutrient enriched material to the consumer. That's the second uh, biggest challenge that I see. The third one is about, um, and I want to take back to Parmiji about the climate change. Um, and that very much relates to what Kartiki had just now asked about the interaction between food production, biodiversity, and this whole uh, concepts of climate change, which is not very much understood by those who really produce food for the country. I have seen uh, for last uh, couple of years, and I want to go beyond these heat waves um, that we have now just now discussed, we have, we have seen the changing pest and disease dynamics in the country. Um, that's really taking a toll on our ability to produce food um, uh, per unit area that uh, we have been producing over a period of time. So my institutions, and I want to give reference to uh, some of these very big, because of climate change, probably we have this influx of new pests and diseases uh, that is affecting the whole production system. So, and that's where I would like to refer back to the ability of uh, New Zealand um, that how, uh, uh, you know, they have been keeping their country uh, free from all kind of these invasive influx of pests and diseases. So there must be um, uh, some legislative mechanisms uh, which is being implemented at a level where you, uh, your border security or, or your quarantine measures or your uh, systems uh, that uh, foolproof your country from uh, the, uh, the, these kind of diseases that come inside and then create havoc. India being such a huge agro climatic uh, diverse country um, uh, such uh, you know very invasive pest creates really big problem for the food production and we've seen uh, it affecting not only vegetable like chili production uh, which is one of the star export product for the country we are facing problem with corn production cotton production because of these uh, changes so one i would like to suggest that anything on quarantine and uh, safeguarding uh, the the collab bilateral uh, programs between Indian quarantine and New Zealand and see how best we can adopt best practices that are being uh, implemented in New Zealand to see that in future India uh, could detect these kind of pests at the border before they enter into a I think we lost him. Uh, there must be some network issue. Uh, Pramit, I mean, once he joins back, he can uh, continue the answer. You would you want to? <clears throat> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, there's should we say there's a whole set of technologies that are available on agriculture, <clears throat> responding to a whole set of different issues, um, and so the game is to basically use as many of them as possible. None of them is a silver bullet. Genetic modification is not a solution for everything. Hybridization is not a solution for everything. Um, biodiversity, the use of different crops uh, using just biodiversity techniques 
But uh, what uh, Dr. Chaudhary is mentioning, and I think is also very important, is agroclimatic changes take place. You're actually seeing entire climate belts shift upwards or downwards, depending on what's happening on the ground. And farmers in those areas have to have to adjust. They have to learn how to grow a completely different set of crops, uh, let alone handle a different set of, of, of pesticides. And this is an entire training program, uh, a learning process uh, that is both expensive uh, because you, your infrastructure is effectively designed for the wrong thing. Um, you have the wrong pesticide knowledge and information. And you need to do this because you can you can't really afford to have two or three crops fail before you understand how this change takes place. Farmers know that it's changing; they don't know how to respond. Uh, surveys in India have shown that forty percent of farmers in India say, "Yeah, there's rain, plenty of rain coming, but we no longer can predict when it's coming." So that means sowing becomes a big issue for us because we don't know when to sow anymore. Um, or, or if you're growing uh, diff different types of rice, for example, require different types of 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 uh, of water uh, on the pre uh, pre uh, predicated on that. So one of the areas we can mention, and I think two areas I just mentioned uh, in terms of taking cooperation further, uh, it was mentioned earlier that state. Remember, in India, agriculture is fundamentally a state government issue. Uh, central government provides guidance, it can provide funding, you can do things like research. But ultimately, it's the state governments that control or decide and implement agricultural policy. This is something Israel, for example, uh, has done very well. They have invited endless streams of chief ministers uh, from the state governments of India. Uh, at one point, I think they actually had showed me, the Israelis showed me a list uh, they said we have gotten something like 20 out of the existing 26 of so the chief ministers of India have all visited Israel at one point or another. And because politics in India, except in city states like Delhi, is fundamentally rural, for them, this is a political priority to be able to go back and say, look, I've got a solution to the water problems of sugar farmers in my state. Um, and what Israel also did is they worked out and because you know New Zealand will have this, a, a little slightly greater problem. New Zealand is very far away, <clears throat> so it takes a it takes a while to persuade somebody uh, to fly all the way to New Zealand. Um, but what the Israelis did, even they will do those distances, but they chose a couple of districts in in uh, sort of pilot areas, uh, Rail Sima in Telangana, and so on, and made them sort of hubs for examples of what Israel can do in agriculture and say, look, this is what we can do in water, this is what we can do in growing vegetables, this is what we do in terms of increasing productivity. They even had a center for mango production because they actually grow mangoes in Israel. They don't have the climate at all. They do it in greenhouses. Uh, but they said, we have ways to grow on non-seasonal periods of showing how to do mangoes. It wasn't necessarily a lot of these were applicable to India. It was just that it was showcasing what India could, what Israel could do. And then you could bring in endless numbers of people because it was in India. So the transportation problems are really easy. Uh, and again, that's something that should be considered. Another area is uh, New Zealand has very good agricultural universities. Um, we know we know Auckland, we know Massey, we know, but people don't know necessarily Lincoln University, one of the top 100 agricultural universities in the world. Uh, and there are others. Um, the new education policy that Indian government has begun to beginning to roll out now opens the doors for such universities to partner with organizations, even private institutions in India, and set up full campuses. They don't have to set up a full university, but if they want to just focus on the agricultural side, we're already seeing the Australians, Griffiths and others are coming already. Uh, they're doing full-fledged university structure. King's College of in England is coming as well. Uh, but again, something that potentially New Zealand could really be a, a good again and it just gives you New Zealand to showcase its capacities as will build as well as build capacity uh, for India as well. If I could just add to what um, both my eminent panelists have said, I think completely agree with the viewpoints around uh, tackling sustainability. Uh, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on three areas that I think, given that this is an agri-tech session, we haven't actually talked about technology per se. So, and I think technology goes beyond um, 
you know, farming practices and farming tools and technology. We're talking about poor tech. We're talking about digital. We're talking about uh, areas which are strengths for both New Zealand and India. New Zealand already has the R&D and the capability. Um, India has the ability to roll at scale. So I think it is, and, and when I say that this is a long-term play, you're not going to be able to get farmers to start using AI and automation tomorrow. Yeah. And it, uh, to Pramit's point, this is an ecosystem to ecosystem play. This has to be, the governments have to bring together those ecosystems uh, and the best of class organizations to bring that technology together. So whether it's AI and automation, whether it's robotics, whether it's drone technology, analytics, IoT and sensors, all of these, by the way, are hugely, you know, brimming sectors in India as well. But what New Zealand can bring is the specific use cases and applications for agri-tech, right? Because India's use cases are quite broad across these areas. New Zealand's will be very, very focused on agri-tech. How do you apply that? And then India can help drive that at scale. Now, how do you drive that at scale? I think we touched on capacity building. Um, and I think someone had a question in the audience about skilling. How do you do skilling? Who pays for the skilling? Uh, how much of that can come from government? You know, government can only do as much especially when you're tackling 1.4 billion people, right? So there are other ways, and I think this is a segue where I want to talk about new mechanisms of creating the, um, the financial environment and greater impetus to invest in creating impact, but yet building more profitable businesses. So, um, you know, the, the whole notion of blended finance is one that I think if I would just end with, if India and New Zealand can collaborate, create the right uh, best practices, the skilling, the technology, the rollout, the ability to roll out at scale, um, there is then an opportunity for this ecosystem together to take it to other markets. And even for India, you know, with blended finance, especially given how much, em how much emphasis there is from the World Bank, on this instrument. I'm not sure how many of our uh, audience are familiar with blended finance, but it is a means of meshing and blending philanthropy grants, concessional capital, and private capital, so that it actually benefits all three of those capital providers. Because philanthropists want to put money into areas to solve problems, but they're also starting to realize that it has to go into businesses that will get sustained over a period of time, right? And that will actually, but still create the right impact they want to see. That's only possible when there is private capital coming in there as well, because it changes the behavior of the uh, of the founders, right? And at the same time, for um, the private capital providers, it actually de-risks the private capital and creates a lot, much larger deployment of capital at scale without compromising shareholder equity, because grants are not going into the cap onto the cap table. So that mechanism is predominantly put in place where you're solving for a specific problem. And that the, the biggest problem you're solving is capacity building, skilling. And then you build out the whole, you're creating impact across the value chain. So um, I would just like to say, I think um, sustainability is a very, very key issue to solve for. And I know it's very important to India and New Zealand, but I also think India has other problems that are much more, real and and you know today we have to solve for people getting food and we have to solve for reducing the spoilage 40 percent of our food gets spoiled on this in the supply chain right if you can just imagine if you could reduce that how many people you're able to feed so i think we have to think of this and that's why it's long term you've got to think of it from a very logical step what's important for new zealand but at the same time what's important for india um and, and put that roadmap across that's sort of my view. Uh, thank you, Amit. Um, okay, so uh, Bhagirath, I know you were cut off, but we're glad you joined. And would you like to continue? Yeah. And then I'll, yeah. Thank you so much. So, you know, to continue uh, this discussion that I was having, I would like to um, suggest suggest uh, two or three very important areas of collaboration as a researcher that I see um, where opportunities between two countries can be harnessed to the level that we are discussing just now. As um, Pr Pramadji mentioned about Israel and uh, Netherlands, I think the low-hanging fruit for bilateral collaboration uh, 
Um, and I, I hope uh, Her Excellency is listening to it. Uh, I think one of the very important bilateral arrangement on research side that can take place between India and New Zealand is to develop a center of excellence on uh, animal livestock uh, disease forecasting, uh, animal breeding, and dairy development. Uh, what And that's, I think, is the core competence of New Zealand. And uh, this would go in line with what being done by Israelis to tap not only help develop capacities of our people to produce good quality vegetables or horticulture produce. Uh, we refer to mangoes and all kinds of vegetables in Haryana and Rail Sima and other places. I think this center of excellence concept um, from New Zealand on and animal um, uh, disease forecasting, uh, animal breeding and uh, uh, dairy development. Uh, can open a new uh, areas of collaboration um, in whole food value chain because uh, animal plays very important role uh, in ensuring the nutritional security component that we have in the country. So that's the one uh, pitch that I would like to really make through this particular um, program. The second important area that I believe that New Zealand should tap, um, and here uh, it would be a New Zealand that would be the biggest beneficiary is to work in collaboration with Prime Minister Fasil Bima Yojana, which is, I think, world largest crop insurance scheme that we have in the country. Um, uh, knowing that New Zealand has expertise in crop uh, animal insurance, rural area insurance, they know how it can be best implemented uh, in very um, uh, climate uh, susceptible environment. Uh, so if we can work out something where our Prime Minister Fasil Bima Yojana, which is a crop insurance scheme, can be factually uh, delivered uh, in terms of both premium and the risk uh, uh, that farmer face. Um, because right now we have some areas where implementation is a very big problem. Uh, we see a lot of issues with respect to uh, claims being made by the farming community. How do you evaluate those claims at very local level? Uh, as climate is changing, those are very uh, special kind of uh, damages that we see. So crop insurance is second very important area that I believe uh, is a low-hanging fruit between two countries. And finally, um, I would like to again buy the idea from Parmiji and say that long-term R&D collaboration uh, on crop, uh, climate resilient, uh, resilient uh, crop varieties, or uh, uh, building a very robust uh, uh, R&D collaboration between scientific community of uh, New Zealand and India uh, would be uh, something that would strengthen, uh, uh, you know, the that will reduce the distances and bridge the big bridge that we have with Netherlands or with Israel to uh, New Zealand as well. So these are a few comments that I would like to uh, I would like to really share uh, with the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Bhagirath. Uh, Jeff, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, look, I just wanted to pick up. Amit uh, touched on the question that's in um, the chat as well, and I and I think. Um, it is uh, agri-tech focus, but with that, I think um, the person that answered the question was spot on. Uh, there, there needs to be um, a conscious effort around skilled labour um, and, and creating opportunities as well to make sure then there's not a void. Um, you might have all the, the greatest tooling if you don't have people that are then uh, also um, being educated at the same speed, then you, know, you, you obviously have that void. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd love to see uh, EdTech play a big role, a collaborative role as well. Uh, we are involved at the moment already with um, you know, a number of institutions, but also industries. Um, so, so the point that's been raised before, there's some of that's already happening, and it's and it's tremendous to see the proactive approach by by a few um, that are, are doing that. And of course, you know, enhancing sort of that employability and and global competitiveness of the skilled labour will all add then to the value for India as well. Um, and one thing I want to make that very clear about this is, you know, and I think we've all got to be conscious of this, is, um, you know, the, the affordability of education. Uh, we all know that um, it's extremely costly for Indians to be educated when the systems aren't already built. Uh, so, so coming up with some innovative ways in which um, that can be achieved uh, in a really cost-effective way uh, manner will also go a long way to um, adding uh, economic uh, and socioeconomic value to India. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, so I think uh, we are almost running out of time. Uh, so can I have uh, one minute closing, quick closing remarks from all of you? And Jeff, would you like to begin? 
my apologies. I thought I did. Um, <laughs> look, I, I just um, I, I just want to again conclude uh, and and pass it back really to to Christine and her. Uh, invitation to join this panel. I think I've learned um, a hell of a lot uh, from listening to it myself. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it's tremendous that there is proactivity uh, around more education on India and the relationship between India and New Zealand specifically. Um, I think, you know, we've already had glimpses of what collaboration can do from the speakers. Uh, and I think that's the most exciting part for those of us that have had the um, the pleasure, really, of being in this country, you see opportunities every day. Uh, so, you know, I would just highly encourage um, anyone that's listening in to this uh, that has a, even a small interest of uh, finding out a little bit more or, or getting in touch, please do so, um, because there are tremendous opportunities. And to Amit's point, you know, we can have a massive global impact uh, through New Zealand technology, uh, combined with um, the scalability of India and um, and quite frankly the the expertise and uh, and know how of Indians to also get things done. So look, thank you very much. I've uh, really enjoyed being um, a part of this, uh, Kartiki. Thank you for um, for allowing me to to be involved. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Amit. Yeah. No. Look, I I, I think um, again, you know, this is such a large topic for us to cover yeah. in this short period and do justice to it because it requires obviously a lot of deep dives into specific areas but i will say a few things i think in terms of partnerships between nations it's based on values and uh, some common threads so if you look at india and new zealand what is common between india and new zealand i think the first one is the common cultural values of the maori culture and indian culture there are a lot of similarities which you're not going to find, and, and I'm not trying to pick on any other nation. I, I think everyone has their own strengths, which you're not going to find in Israel and and and, uh, and Netherlands and, and so on. I think that's one. Second is the love of the common sport. Now, cricket, right? So sport ties nations together. It ties societies together. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take a more sort of pragmatic view of what pulls nations together, right? And India and New Zealand enjoy very, very, very warm relations, at least from a people to people perspective. We actually have, I don't know, Je I don't want to embarrass Jeff, but we actually have a world record holder in Jeff Allen sitting there, who I don't know how many of you are actually aware that Jeff holds the world record for the maximum number of wickets in a World Cup in 1999 in the cricket yeah. world. <laughs> so, um, the third is the love of films. I don't know how many people are actually aware that while India has the largest film industry, New Zealand actually makes some of the biggest blockbuster movies around the world. The Lord of the Rings, Avatar, uh, and there's many more examples. So there is already a lot of common threads. I would say if we had to really look at what can the, some of the next steps be and what could the priorities be, I just want to focus back on, you know, we talk about agri-tech and we have yet not touched on digital at all on this panel. And I think unless we're talking about digital, it is never going to be relevant to India because India's biggest strength today is digital. So if you want to solve for something in India, leverage India's biggest strength because you're creating opportunity for India, right? So I, I agree with all the other pieces around, you know, livestock, you know, disease prevention, creating the biodiversity. There are many, many learnings from New Zealand, but those are going to be more sort of academic Whereas what will implement in a commercial scale will be the technology, digital technology implementations. And that's a good place to start. So join R&D across everything that we talked about today, all the four panelists. Um, skilling is going to be very critical. And I think New Zealand with its, uh, like Jeff said, with the universities and you know, Pramit referenced some of the universities. So there's opportunities to bring that and maybe bring part of ag research, which is a New Zealand agency to bring that capability into uh, India from a skilling and R&D perspective. And the most important one I will always say is going to be building digital capacity in India because that is India's biggest strength. And that's the best place to start and harness. That's my view. Thank you, Amit. Uh, Bhagirat? Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Christine, you know, before we go off uh, for putting together this, such a wonderful panel. Uh, you know, uh, the call to action here um, what comes out of this particular discussion that we had. I think, Christine, I would suggest that if you can really come out with even an online forum 
called Agri Food Entrepreneurship Forum between India and New Zealand. Um, we will we will find the market. We will explore it. We will find entrepreneurs. But we need that kind of platform where engagement like like this can continue. That platform can also be used um, to influence uh, the governments uh, because since a lot of bilateral engagements are happening, as we heard in the uh, from uh, Her Excellency, so such kind of forum where you bring entrepreneurs together in agri food value chain would be the biggest outcome of this uh, particular forum. And I hope that um, uh, a person with a huge uh, uh, quest for agriculture innovation. Uh, I traveled across the world, 60 countries, but New, New Zealand is still remain very far from me. So I <laughs> hope uh, I hope to see agriculture farm of New Zealand one day. Thank you so much. So we'll uh, continue to engage on agri-food dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Bhagirat. Promise. So I'll just mention that one area of cooperation <clears throat> that uh, we could also be looking at at some point. India has set up a Pacific Island Forum, as some of you will know. Uh, it was an afterthought. It was set up really without India giving. It didn't think it, it had much traction in the Pacific, uh, South Pacific. And so it was set up a few years ago. Um, uh, what to be India's surprise has been is that the Pacific Islanders have been very excited by this. Uh, and there is now an entire <clears throat> section of the foreign ministry which works on this because uh, we have seen uh, the, the prime minister, you know, uh, prime minister visit Papua New Guinea, for example. Um, and in fact, the demands coming in from a lot of these island states in the South Pacific uh, has been quite extensive. So a lot of, for example, digital technology in marsh places like the Marshall Islands and so on. India set up the satellite networking structures and so on. Um, <clears throat> and this has become an extremely interesting extension of Indian foreign policy in an, a region of the world where India never really thought of itself as being a player. Uh, but it's it's stretched. It does not have the capacity to do all, all that much in those areas. Uh, so it needs help. And we've done, so we're working with the Australians already in that area. And I presume it, or hope for at some point we should be working very closely with the New Zealanders on this, including hopefully in agriculture. Thank you, Pramit. Uh, I think if I may just... Yeah, please go ahead. Last thing, and, and I think Bhagirat, the comments you made, I... Um, I couldn't help but put on my, my hat as the global chairman of Thai, which is the world's largest entrepreneur and investor community. And it's a give back platform. I'm sure most of you, especially in India, are familiar with the Indus Entrepreneur. Uh, we are the largest um, network of entrepreneurs and investors. And it's all about giving back. We are actually supporting a lot of countries, including India, of course. We have been very deeply involved in shaping India's entrepreneur ecosystem as well as the investor ecosystem. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to do something and support this to Bhagirat's uh, recommendation. We should uh, look at bringing those entrepreneur ecosystems together between New Zealand and India. Because the one thing is when you bring entrepreneurs together, there's always action that will happen. Because entrepreneurs mean business and they will make it happen, right? So it goes beyond all the... The, the theoretical discussions. Uh, so I think it was a great suggestion. And I just want to thank Christine and, of course, um, Her Excellency High Commissioner Nita Bhushan for, for the time and the opportunity. And let's hope that something meaningful comes out of this. Yes, let's hope. Uh, thank you uh, to all the participants here. Thank you for taking out your time to be on this panel uh, discussion and a very important one. Um, also, there's a lot to, you know, still discuss or uncover in this space and, you know, this, but this conversation has been really uh, comprehensive and insightful and, you know, many new ideas have come up, of course, and, and, and I hope that, you know, we will continue this discussion some other time, but very soon. Over to you, Christine. Thank you. Well, well thanks, Kartiki. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating and I absolutely love it when we sort of throw it uh, had three takeaways as our aims at the beginning. And then we had someone uh, uh, throw down the gauntlet and say, look, let's um, put together an agri-food um, center for entrepreneurship. Well, that's um, I think that's a real tribute to the panel um, discussion this, um, this evening or this afternoon in India. Um, time is of the essence. I think that's very obvious. Uh, Long-term thinking, 
but we better get um, moving on this one. Um, there's some real urgency in terms of um, climate issues, food, food needing to be um, uh, produced and um, other countries already um, making um, great inroads where New Zealand has great expertise. Um, so that is that is the challenge. So we encourage everyone to act on what they've heard. Feel free to reach out um, to ourselves, to um, Aspen and Anta, or to um, Institute in New Zealand, um, to get in contact with um, the people on the panel and ourselves. Um, and if you haven't already, please sign up to our newsletter so you can keep informed for the next in the series of this uh, fantastic um, collaboration we have with uh, our partner Aspen and Anta. Thank you, everyone.